on two wheels this week, Jeff takes a ride on BMW's rather strange looking C1. Sarah D travels to another bike meet this week, she's down at Box Hill. And stand by for lots of fun and games as Wayne and I go behind the scenes of a major bike show. All of this plus Wayne's Warehouse and more Better Bikes with Gary Thompson. Welcome to Two Wheels, and this time with a roof on. And not only that, it's also got a windscreen wiper. Just look at this. Have you ever seen anything like that before? Because this is BMW's C1. But not only that, this has also got seat belts, as you can see. So all you have to do to get off it, undo that seat belt, undo this one here. They actually cross over in the middle, take those off. And then you don't even have to clamber off and put the stand down because here you've got a couple of levers. This one actually puts down the stand there. I'm supposed to take my weight off the bike first. Let's drop the stand down. Let me just show you. There it goes. See that? And then you pull this big lever, which actually lifts the front wheel off the ground. And there we are. Puts the bike on the stand. Solid as a rock. And there we have it. The new city commuter. And it's not short on creature comforts in other ways as well. See this little dashboard here, very car-like. In fact, if I just turn the ignition on here, display lights up there, you've got a speedo, a fuel gauge there, and your indicators, which is on this one here. There we go, right. Now that little hesitation there was because this is a BMW, yeah, but the switch gear is completely different. This is actually orthodox, dare we say. Indicators over here, click, click, and a push to turn off. The lights at the top there, flasher. Coming over to this side, there's a unique one, windscreen wipers, which you just don't normally see, do you, on a motorbike? And also a little button there, which is the one that operates the windscreen washer. Hydraulic front brake, hydraulic back brake, of course, you can see the things there. And it's even got fresh air vents on there, because this is a real windscreen, a glass windscreen. So it's got fresh air vents, just to remind you, oops, let's turn that off, that you're on some sort of two-wheeler. Now mechanically, it's not much different to any scooter really. As I said earlier, four-stroke engine, in fact 176cc because this is the new C1200. Four-valve Rotax um, engine, very ecological catalytic converter as well, which is quite something on a bike this small. Coming around to the front, it makes such a change on these things, you can't see anything really. But what you can see down there, single disc brake up the front, and see these little telltale segments there, that means it's got ABS. So ABS braking as well, anti-lock braking, catalytic converter, all mud cons. But this is normal with this thing. They are in fact catching on. We might not have seen lots and lots of them about, but they've been on sale in BMW car showrooms because this is fitting a new segment. It's not a scooter, it's not a motorbike. It's a new form of transport. And I know someone who's got one. So let's go and have a word. Graham, good to see you, my man. Oh, yeah. This is Graham Naseby. He's the guy I was telling you about who's actually bought one of these. I shouldn't make it sound like that, should I? Because it's not that that's such a strange thing to do, is it, Graham? <laughs> and first off, I can see a little advert on there. We'll try not to show that. But right. you actually use this for business use, don't you? I do, yeah. Yeah, most days, actually. Yeah, Come but... rain or, or whatever. And you're in the tree felling business, but you don't use this for pulling trees down? No, out for doing quotes. <laughs> no, I've not managed to get a tow bar on it as yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be asking a bit much. But you've got a big box on the back of this one. Is that an optional extra? Uh, it is an optional extra, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's ideal for me because I can just drop the helmet in when I go in to do a quote. It's got all my uh, uh, A to Zs in there and... Uh, chainsaw? Uh, well, you could get a chainsaw in it. It's that big, actually. Yeah, it looks absolutely massive. Yeah. Now, Graham, I know you as a keen biker anyway because you've got the FJR 1300 and you've got the That's big it. beamer, the That's old it. 1100 LT. Yeah. So, what made you buy one of these? Which you've got to admit is a bit of a, an odd vehicle for a biker, isn't it? It is. Is a, a friend of mine uh, works for uh, BMW. He's the one that set me off. Really, he came up on it, and uh, I just liked the idea of it. And I thought, well, that would be absolutely brilliant for going out doing quotes because you're very limited on time to when you can do quotes. Because if you try and do them in the rush hour. Uh, it's completely hopeless in a car, so I thought, right, that would be the right, uh, the right thing to uh, to go yeah. out on. And how yeah. do you find the weather protection in general? Because I mean, you look, it's fine from the front, but you look exposed from the side. But uh, again, you found it pretty good. You yeah, can actually, you ride like this in all weathers, do. do you? Yeah, well, not all weathers. Unless, unless it's absolutely throwing it down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is 
this is how I've been riding this summer. Yeah. Yeah. Don't even need leathers or nothing. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Now I've got to come clean. That red one that I had isn't mine, obviously, but it belongs to a guy, Dave Alexander, and he's actually travelled 130 miles up to be at our little film shoot today. Haven't you, Dave? Yep. <laughs> and Dave, he actually works for BMW, and you're the warranty manager? I'm one of the regional warranty, warranty managers, managers from BMW, yeah. yeah. But that's for the whole outfit. This is cars, bikes, these. And, yep, everything. And the new Mini, as you were saying, yep. saying before. But tell me, is this in effect your company vehicle then? It's the one I use the most for the company, yes. Um, yeah. I've had mine since about March, and since then I stopped using the car, and I use this all the time. And you find, find it sound? Or how do you get on for sort of side winds and whatnot? Any problem? Or? It's no different from a normal bike in a side wind. Yeah. Um, there's, you can see there's not much more side area yeah, than a conventional big bike. Yeah. It just goes straight through. Yeah. The weather protection is superb. I, I don't wear the bike gear unless it's really tipping down, yeah. then I wear a bike jacket. Yeah. But apart from that, I, I ride as virtually what you see me wearing today. Well, when I saw you come up today, you just had a fleece on, didn't you? Yeah. And, and the weather has been a bit iffy, hasn't it? Earlier on it was raining, yeah. but you, you remain dry. Well, yeah. coming up the M42, it was torrential rain, but yeah. uh, you know, stayed dry through the, through the lot. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, well, needless to say, you'd be recommending one then, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. I think Everyone should have one. Instead of a car, get one of these. <laughs> The basic C1 will cost you £3,395 on the road, the top of the range executive £4,120. So with traffic sent to increase by 50% over the next 20 years, who knows this could be the future for the motorist who doesn't like bikes. Again and welcome to Box Hill, so cold because it once had an abundance of box trees growing on it. It's 172 metres high, just north of Dorking, south of the M25 and the hustle and bustle of the City of London. Now Box Hill overlooks the wheels of Surrey and Sussex and any map will tell you that this is a country park and a spectacular viewing point. So it gets a lot of visitors, but on Sunday you guessed it, Box Hill is home to bikers and it has been since at least 1947. So let's go and make ourselves part of that history. I've just met up with Brett here who claims he's very shy but I couldn't avoid speaking to him because he owns a Triumph Tiger. How long have you had this bike? About 22 years. Yeah? And is it good on the road? Do you enjoy riding it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's fun. Um, slow, no brakes, but it's, it's good fun. It's good fun. <laughs> have you had any other Triumphs? Yeah, I've got a 509. Oh, lovely. Is, uh... And how does that compare with this one? <laughs> chalk and cheese, chalk and cheese. <laughs> it stops and it goes <laughs> very quickly. So did you have to rebuild this bike when you got yeah. it? Yeah, it's uh, a basket case, um, literally just in bits. Um, I had the tank, the oil tank, and that was all the metal work, frame and engine obviously. Um, but I had to rebuild wheels and buy mud guards and seats and gauges and things. But, uh, How did you find the parts for a bike? Auto as as jumbles, this? friends. Yeah. Um, as soon as you start building one, you suddenly find lots of people who have parts and odds and sods that, you know, comes to. Yeah, it all sort of migrates towards yeah, you. Yeah. Are you part of a Triumph group or anything like that? We're the Surrey Triumph Owners Club. Um, but when I was building with this, I was with the Mighty South London, um, which uh, have a lot more, they won't like me saying, older generations in it, <laughs> who have a lot more knowledge of these bikes. So, um, well, they'll forgive me for saying that because they should be down here, but they're probably still in bed. I found Nathan, he's got a KTM. Now, tell me all about this bike. It's Former like started as the off-road world sort of thing. And it's been made for the road purely for the road. And uh, 620cc, top speed of about 115 mile an hour. Obviously, you never do that on the road. Um, and it's just like fun, really. Is this the first bike you've had, or what did no, you have? No, I've had a lot of trailers, but I've just gone for this one. You know, more fun than the others. And not much. I don't go off-road that much anymore. So, you know. And it works well on road, then. Oh, lovely! You can leave a lot of the big bikes standing. You know, really? not the you know, bigger sports bikes, so, you know, it's all like water cooled and just, you know, a bit of fun really, that's all it is. Now tell me about this brilliant machine that you've got here. Superb. How long have you had this? Uh, since May this what's year. It, what's it like to drive? Lovely. Absolutely excellent fun. What did you have before this machine? Uh, I've had a fire blade before this. Um, I, I couldn't list them all. <laughs> uh, uh, 30 or 40 bikes. 
So tell me about the engine of this bike. I know very little about it myself. Uh, it's a GSX-R1000. Uh, it's the new Suzuki. Um, and in the popular colours are blue and white. <laughs> That's short and sweet. <laughs> Would you swap it for any other machine at the moment? Yeah, I'll probably get rid of it at the end of the year and get another one. And we'll join Sarah for more biking conversation later in the show. Uh, hello, excuse me, I'm over here. Look, will you come here? Look, look, I'm over here, look. Row N, seat 27. Here, look, come here. Come a bit closer, that's better. I can talk to you properly now. Now, on behind the scenes this week, we've decided to come and show you what goes on behind a big show, the setup of a motorcycle show. So we've come to what is definitely a very, very quiet place. This is the Peterborough East of England showground. It's not wrong, you know, it is very, very quiet. Look, the place is absolutely deserted because this is the day before the show actually opens. This is Friday, the show is a weekend show, Saturday, Sunday. It's not the big BMF show that we visit every year. That happens way back in May. This is the BMF tail end show. Slightly smaller show, but just as frantic for all of the exhibitors. Hey, mate, what are you up to here? You look very official. You look like you know what you're doing, even. I do know what I'm doing. I've been uh, I've been getting involved with this, you know. Involved? Do, doing my bit. I pity them if you're involved. It's a military operation, this, mate. I have it running like clockwork. You're just like uniforms, that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is, yeah. I don't tell anybody. So this is a fancy bit of map, like, and numbers and things. It looks very complicated. It is a very complicated thing to organise a show like this, Well, if it's so complicated, then, they must have been doing it for an awful long time. Now, where the day before the event? Oh, months, months, many, many months before the planning starts, really. Does In fact, it? as soon as this, this year's show's finished, people will be thinking about next year's. Right. They will. And, well, and if I was an exhibitor then, right, right, and I wanted to come and do this, do I have to let them know six months in advance? Uh, as early as you can, but you've got a deadline of three weeks prior to, uh, to the show. So if you've not applied for your, your pitch three weeks before the show, chances are you're going to struggle to get one. Right then. So I've let you know, because I'm a good right. boy, so months in advance. Months in advance, so you've booked the pitch. We yeah. would send you then a booking form, Yeah. and you'd get a booking on that form. It will say things like, uh, do you need a marquee? If you need a marquee, the organisers will hire a marquee for, for your use, from a local firm. But let's be fair, a small tent will do. Maybe <laughs> <of> them, <laughs> anyway. I was thinking more of a phone box, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but you, can, you, can, you can get a marquee organised for you. What about you might sparks, want, electric? You might and want all electric, that. I was going to say. You might need electric, some in a generator, you might need an electric point. Things like tables and chairs you might need. All of them can they be can hired on that. your behalf, obviously at a cost, on, on your behalf well, by the organisers. So when you arrive on site with your goods to sell, job's done, you just stack your tents up and... and right carry. then, well let me ask you this then. What if I've decided to come and have three massive marquees, because I'm greedy and I want the biggest display that is, right? <laughs> yeah. The day before is no good to me. <laughs> the day before uh, would be know, no good. You can't get rigged up quick enough. The site is open. It's a, it's a weekend event. Saturday, Sunday, but the site is open from the Monday before. So five days before, you could come here and, and actually start getting things ah, organised. Right and would you believe that the organisers themselves, they're here on the Monday before because wow. they have a, a big list of how many exhibitors they've got. This weekend, there's 200. 200 exhibitors this weekend, right? So where do they all go? They can't just say, right, go in, find yourself a marquee set up. Oh, no, it's th that's where... That's where the map comes in. where the it. map comes right in because then. what they'll do is they have to... Daft as it sounds, literally, walk round the field, measuring out and plotting out the site, thinking, well, we can't put that there, that's too big. He needs an opening there, so that has to be free there. We need a catering wagon there, we need a toilet block there, all this. Got your drift. So it's a very complicated operation. Don't what I can't understand is how an organisation who has set something up as fantastic as this, and so organised, and as you say, it's like a military operation, mm. I've got you involved. Well, you know, there was no one else there. Obviously I was there not. earlier, you see. Um, just, can you help me then? As soon as you get your map in front of me. I've got my map, yeah. Toilets. There are toilets, I presume. There's some... We're there, right? Yeah. And there's some right over there in the corner. Uh, right. Okay. Excuse me, just one second, cos I feel the need. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, madam. Sorry, I'm just... Oops, ladies. Ah. I knew I should have stayed in the Boy Scouts for another week or two. Gents. Gents. <coughs> How embarrassing. Never mind. She looked quite attractive as well. She had no knickers on. This is, uh, this is my mate JJ. 
just give me your... Oh. The JJ the Engraver. Yes, indeed. Never yes. short of a word or two, eh? No, no. You're very no. organised here, JJ. You're one of the few stalls that's ready to go. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yes, Cynthia and I and my wife, we, uh, we come along to the bike shows and we just love it, actually. Do you only but, do bike shows? Oh, no, no. We do other shows as well. We, we just actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were at the Great Dorset Steam Fair. And we did that, and that was very good. But we do bike shows, steam engine rallies, one or two aircraft shows, American car shows. Right. Anywhere there's people. Yes, indeed, yeah, as long as there's a lot of people. Oh, I don't believe it. No. <laughs> I'm going to tell my mum now. <laughs> Typical, isn't it, eh? He gets a responsible job that involves map reading and directing people around the site. Me? I get one making a brew. Hive of activity here, isn't it, eh? Well, we're going to leave you for the moment from behind the scenes. We'll bring you a little bit more later in the programme. Meanwhile, Paul's gone for a bit of a kip. I'm going for a brew and we'll see you guys later. Well, they look like a bunch of animals. I don't know how the hell they're wheeling them things. I'm that one's definitely knacking that one there. If you think some of the bikes we've seen today are old, then let me tell you, Box Hill sits on top of a track that runs through the Mole Valley that is ancient. Now this track runs from Farnham right the way across to Dover. It's over 130 miles long and it's known as the North Downs Way. Now some maps say that this track is called Pilgrim's Way, but it was there well before the pilgrims of medieval times were wandering up and down it. In fact, it's reckoned that it was there in prehistoric times and linked Stonehenge with the coast. Now that is old. I've met up with Pete and Mike, who apparently come to Box Hill quite often. Why do you come here then? Um, it's a meeting place for everyone comes here to show their, uh, their bikes off, their pride and joy. Uh, it's a good place to talk to people as well. Um, talk about what they've done, all the sort of uh, snazzy bits that they've done to their bike. Yeah, it's interesting. That's why we come here. Yeah, do you polish your bike before you arrive? Uh, guilty, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, but don't tell anyone. But yes, I do. It, it, is, uh, it has been known that I polish uh, the bike as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. And your friend Mike here, who was wearing exactly the same fleece no. when he arrived. No, no, no not true. Well, <laughs> well, I was wearing mine first, actually, and then he put his on afterwards just to be like me, I think. All oh, right. But, uh, I see. Yeah. but I've got the yellow bike, obviously, and, and he hasn't. So. He's got the black bike. <laughs> yep. So, like two Bs, really? Something like yeah. that. To be yeah, yeah. or not to be? Oh, that is no. the question. That's the question. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite busy. It's a good atmosphere down here. We always come here every week. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a good, good, it's a good, good venue place. to meet. There's a nice place to have a burger as well, so it's a good excuse to get a uh, lunch where there's lots of bikes. This <laughs> is Kevin, and he used to have a Suzuki 1000, and now he's got a Ducati 748. Why did you go for this bike? Uh, it's just a nice bike. I prefer. You know, I thought I'd be compromising on horsepower, but it's a really nice bike. Handles nice. It's it's a quick bike. 748 2001 model. Brilliant bike. Absolutely, it's a gorgeous looking machine. Yeah. So what happened to your Suzuki then? Uh, blind people kept running into it. <laughs> twice. <laughs> I've owned it two weeks and got smashed up twice in two weeks in the same spot. Really? Really, so it was jinxed, so we had to be out of it. Uh -huh. 
So I've ended up with that. When I see an old Triumph, I personally am in my element. I just love these machines. Now this is a trophy. It's sort of like a road racer. But the bike I really love is the Triumph Thunderbird. Now the first Triumph Thunderbird, you may have seen it in the film The Wild Ones. It starred Marlon Brando. He drove that bike. And uh, there is a quote that everybody remembers from the film, and it sort of goes, what are you rebelling against, Johnny? I don't know, what do you got? Well, we've got more bikes from Box Hill later in the show. Right now, we're going back to Peterborough. Well, welcome back to Behind the Scenes. Now, we've had a little break, haven't we? And I know that Paul has gone for what he calls a catnap which is usually about five hours to be honest with you because when you get his age, well you know and I know exactly where he is Go that way, one that way um, now, Angel, I've noticed here, look, listen, how is it then that oh, they're doing all the work and you're just stood around doing nothing? Because I'm an highly paid executive, I'm just the, I'm just the backbones to the structural <laughs> bit to it all. Listen, your shop now, what happens at the shop? Nothing, shut. You're joking? It's closed. So you shut the shop to come yeah, and do come this? Here. Come here. How many people are here then helping out? About 15. And then one more like you, because I said helping and a, out. And yeah. a supervisor. And a supervisor. supervisor. Yeah. You'd be good in the council, wouldn't you? You Super, would. Uh, so, big operation on. How many days up front before you get here, all the organisation and so on? Two days before the show, set up, and two days to take down. Blink it. But then you've got a week's work to put it all back in the shop and to get shop sorted and then sort of, and It's a big job. But you've been doing it for a long time. You do all the big shows, Five indoor years. shows, exhibitions yeah. and everything, and you come here. Yeah. Is it obviously worth it? Yeah, it's a good show. A good show, it's a good entertainment, a good party. Um, ah, so you treat it as a bit of a fun do. Yeah, yeah, You're not going to tell me that this is the staff Christmas party. This is the one. <laughs> there'll be attractive young ladies on the stage tomorrow night. So they will, I'll yeah. Them, I'll pay for them to get in to see these that, You mean that free entertainment that oh, you're Oh, is that pay? a free one? So oh, I, yeah. I don't tell them. They think it's free. <laughs> they it's paid for. I'm paying a tenner a man. <laughs> Honestly. You know, it's not on, is it, eh? Some fellas have fancy whacking it in devices, pneumatic devices, petrol driven, an old matey boy here, he gets a blinking wooden mallet and the biggest steel state you've ever seen in your life. Man, yeah, I was in the scouts. Now this, in my opinion, is the most important marquee on the whole site. It is, of course, the beer tent. And who would I find in the beer tent? Wayne. There he is. Hello, Wayne. Hello, Paul. Give us a song, Wayne. Two wheels, red and motors. <laughs> yeah, do you want a drink? <laughs> The only gripe I've got about these shows, you come into the beer tent for a pint, you've walked round flaming miles to get round the whole of the site, and then you can't even find a chair to sit on. And of course, apart from all the exhibitors and the caterers and the security and all those sort of people, they're all here days and days before setting up. Of course, the live entertainment has to come as well. That gets here the day before. They set up the stage with all their equipment and then, of course, we have the sound check. Go on, Wayne. Test it there. Uh, test it. One, two, three. A night fever, a night fever. You go <laughs> You get me? Can you hear me? Not now, girls, please. No autographs at the moment. Thank you. Right, I'm just going to help out a bit here because they need somebody who knows what they're doing. Ben, just move out of the way. Hang on, get that one. Yeah, here we go now. Here we go. Hey, but you know, not everybody's got what you might refer to as a large erection, like this great big tent here. Some people have got what you might call DIY. Look at these folk here. They're all geared up, they've got the caravan, they've got the awning, and now the gazebo's going up. You brought the barbecue? Yes. I'll be over later. Come and see you later. <laughs> so, here we have it. Hey, I tell you what, there's some serious organisation goes into this. Oh, I told, well, I told you, it was a, it's a military operation, mate. And a lot of hard work, people, physical. You know, oh yeah, a lot of physical uh, lifting and pushing and something. Which you don't understand. A lot of grunting and groaning goes on in these tents. And that's what we've got the campsite, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, but it is, it is a, a big operation. Nothing, no detail is left to chance. You know? So what do you think could go wrong? What, what would be the worst nightmare like? 
The worst nightmare that a show like this could have is basically the weather. Ah, of course. The one thing that you can't plan is usually the one thing that lets you down. Yeah, uh, the, the outdoor weather. shows is vulnerable, of course. If it rains and thunders and lightning all weekend, then um, the attendance won't be as good as it's been in the past. The attendance being what sort of figures? Generally speaking, this show about fifteen to 20,000, would you wow. believe? Wow! Which is a lot of people over two days. It is, isn't it? It's a lot of people to keep happy, and you've got to keep them happy. Good job you're not involved in that bit then, isn't it, really? <laughs> I noticed you found the toilets as well earlier. Uh, yeah, but I just was a bit late. <laughs> and the fair's here, as you can see. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Hey, it's the louder you scream, the faster we go. Here we go now. So, hey, the only thing is, yeah. we've got to sit here for about another eight hours or 12 hours because it's not open until tomorrow. Well, we'll wait, shall we? Oh, it'll be worth it. We'll be first in the queue. you got a quid, will you? <laughs> Are you paying? <laughs> You join us on day two of our seven day tour that will eventually take in the Scottish Highlands and Islands. On the previous day we would travelled nearly a hundred miles by boat, making the trip out through the Sound of Mull to the Outer Hebrides. There weren't many miles ahead of us for today, a fairly easy day's riding, but the scenery was to be spectacular, almost not of this planet. We would take in the single road that travels the length of South and North Uist, out towards the Isle of Harris and Lewis. Today's touring tip comes from touring master Jim, and it is this. Well, what is it? It's, it's on the jacket, for right. your jacket flaps. And the, mo the modern-day jacket, you've got these like fancy these. lining things, but in jackets which are one piece, what you need is two pieces of inner tube, like this, which this is, is an inner tube? This is an inner tube from the old bikes. Right. That's what it is. Good, strong elastic. Yeah. And all you do is put it up like over there, up. like that, and it stops it flapping. So at roughly zero expense? Yes. Do you know, I bet somebody so, makes something at about a tenner that does yes. exactly the well, same. Well, now you've given me an idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a business. Jim, thank you very much. Today's touring tip couldn't be much simpler, but very effective. The bulk of the day's miles were covered in the morning, which meant the afternoon left a little bit of time for sightseeing. Well, just to prove that us bikers aren't entirely a heathen bunch of yobs, a bit of culture. This is St Clement's Church, which back in 1549 was the first church to bring Christianity here to the Isle of Harris, where I suspect it was about as bleak then as it is today. Our second stop was off the beaten track at a roadside shack where a worldwide industry is based. Apart from whisky, of course, another famous Scottish export is Harris Tweed. And it's made here at Luskantar and exported all over the world. And it's actually made, the process takes place, over there in a shed. I kid you not. You make Tweed here, for how long has it been made here like this? Well, on Harris it's been made for the last 150 years like this, and no one has Harris Tweed in that time. In exactly the same way. In exactly the same way, yes. Not perhaps as it is now before, because initially it was made in wooden looms and hand looms. Although this is still regarded as a hand loom, but you can see it's foot operated and metal one. So you sit here, pedalling away, making this, which is a very skilled job, looking out there yes. at the sea in an incredible view, when the rain or mist lifts, yes. uh, knowing that it's going to Japan. That must yes. be an unbelievable feeling. Do you feel connected to these places when you know your, your materials? Sometimes going? you do, you do. You're trying to imagine what, how they're going to cut it up, they're going to cut it up. But you're trying your best to keep straight, keep taunt, keep tight, everything. And it's going to be used. Just just a crazy idea. You couldn't knock up a nice bike saddle cover, could you? No, I couldn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like one of those. I'll leave you to it. Thank you. By the end of the day's trip, we hadn't covered that many miles. But to all intents and purposes, we'd come to the other end of the world, right on the outer limits of the UK, on the verge of the Atlantic Ocean. Right, well, finally, we're here. This is the reason why Peter named this trip Beaches on the Moon, because this is the beach on the moon. OK, everybody, last one in the sea. But it was a breathtaking place, with porpoises playing off the shore, pure clean waves crashing onto the beach. Even ordinary everyday sheep somehow look a little bit different in such a unique environment. We wanted to stay forever, but we had to get back to the hotel in order to relax properly, ready for another day's riding tomorrow. <laughs> Is 
This week on Wayne's Warehouse, I'm going to spend some more of your hard-earned cash on what you might ask on luggage. There's all sorts of different types of luggage, soft luggage, hard luggage, you name it, there's everything. And you're going to need it, aren't you? Let's be fair, if you buy a modern superbike nowadays, truth is you can't carry a blinking thing, not even a toothbrush if you want to go touring, or if you want to go to the supermarket and stack a whole load of stuff up, or even, listen, a mobile phone. Excuse me just one sec. Hello. Hello, Paul. How are you, mate? Oh, you've got a problem. A problem with what? Problem with those tablets I give you. Oh, I do apologise, mate. I'm sorry. No, no, I'll have to go now because I'm talking to camera, Paul. I'm trying to do an article here. All right, then. See you soon. God, he does mind me. I've told him not to ring me when I'm at work. Right, luggage. That's what we're going to talk about, luggage. Loads of different types of luggage. Now, it's true to say a lot of people do prefer to fasten bags to them very selves like that a little sort of pack that goes over there you fit a few things in there you want a bit more to throw in your rucksack like that you can do capacity is quite big with something like that they even do rucksacks now would you believe with a back protector built into it fairly good idea but i'm very opposed to carrying bags on you because of the fact is whatever's in it can do you an injury now some of the bag manufacturers like this guy which is an australian product would you believe crumpler which is what they're called gone and introduced this which has got loads of padding all around the bag and this one is designed for a laptop you can stick your laptop in there and with all the padding around it it does protect it but i'm very opposed to suggesting you put luggage over you fasten it to you because of course if you did fall off your bike and you had luggage, hard stuff in that luggage which is fastened to you you could damage yourself it's like a lethal weapon so let's go down the avenue of putting the luggage on the bike rather than on you Something as simple as that, a tail pack, a seat bag. That's from Oxford Products, bungee hooks, they go around the seat, fasten it on the back, you can fit a whole load of gear in there, loads of separate pockets, even expands. Something like that is ideal, and that'll cost you 100 quid for something as fancy as that. Jivy here, now this one's fairly sort of innovative, it does a bit of everything, because it's got magnetic pieces here, under there, they fasten to your petrol tank if you so desire, or if you prefer not, you can put it on the seat and using fastening devices round the seat itself onto here, it's a seat pack. It even expands and you can even make it into a rucksack. The whole kit together is ingenious. It's got Scotch guided material, it's made out of um, good old Cordura, it's tough stuff, multicolours, and that's 75 quid's worth. If you don't fancy going on your tank, you can get two rolls like that, expanded into a massive thing. You can fit an awful lot of bit of kit in there, but it does only sit on the seat of your bike. It wouldn't go on the tank. Far too big. Tank bags. A lot of people are a bit dubious about tank bags because what if they've got an aluminium tank, for example, so you can't use magnets? Well, it's easy to resolve because such as these guys held have had the sense to produce a multi-fit device. They do different base units. So this one's a strap-on device. You can use it round the tank head, you can use it on the seat, or you can buy a magnetic base. Uh, extra bit of money there, 20, 30 quid for the base, and then you buy the tank bag itself, which is 50 quid. And then, of course, there's always going down the avenue of panniers, and that's the panniers they throw over the seat, either side of the back of the seat, so you can get a passenger on the back while you're still carrying a lot of luggage. And if you want to not buy any of that kit and just use what you've only got at home already, maybe a big tool roll or a big bag or something like that, you want to be able to fasten it on. Traditional bungee straps, everybody knows about a bungee strap, it's fine, but you've got to use four or five of them. Why not get one form of device, and that is this, which I've got to unhook here. And they're fantastic, they're a luggage net, and you can pick these up for around a fiver, and that'll carry absolutely anything on the back of a rack or over the seat. But the real stuff that you've got to get, eh? it's no good bothering with the soft stuff. Let's get on the hard stuff. No, I don't mean get on the hard stuff, I mean hard luggage. So here we are, this is the hard stuff. Can't beat a bit of hard stuff. There's several manufacturers around the world, but the main three in the UK available for the UK, which are actually all made in Italy, is the likes of Nonfango, Kappa and Jive. Now you can buy just one box like that, which is a nice hard box, secure, that you can clip to a mounting plate on the back of your bike. You haven't already got a rack you need to buy one and they do specific kits and they even do universal ones so for around 50 60 pounds upwards you bung on the rack then you buy a box and they vary from little tidgy ones 50 60 pounds to even two and three hundred pounds depending on how high tech you want it with brake lights all sorts of features
Your general price categories, I've said, around £300 upwards. But what if you want to spend some hard-earned Wonka and get loads of fancy kit and have a litre of capacity that is frightening, as in like 50 litres either side of the bike and 50 litres on the back, colour coordinated to your bike and so on, you're looking at six and 700 quid. Amazing, isn't it? And I don't mind if you do. In fact, if you'd like to give me your order now, I'll take it for you. What bike have you got, sir? Now, if you come to Box Hill, you're going to meet up with Jack here. That's He's right. Infamous, aren't you? Yes. Now, how long have you been at this meeting place? 30 odd years. 30 odd years. That's now, a what, long time. Everybody's meeting here in the car park today. Was this always the place that they, they met? Yes. I've been down on this part of the ground for a good 30 odd years. Definitely 30 odd years. Were they ever allowed to go up to the top of Box Hill, the bikers? I don't know about them. I just adhere to myself. What I, when they're here, they're here and I have to look after them. So this is your site? Absolutely. Now I can see you've got absolutely loads of badges all over, including one here from the Surrey Police. Does that give you more responsibility, having been given this badge? Oh, no, I do not take advantage of it. But it's there because at one time the police and the uh, bikers they don't never got on. Right. But uh, I don't know what to say. But I used to, I've had to do a little bit of cutting work to to get the two to come together. Mm. And now the police and the bikers are great, they're friends, and that's what it's all about. Getting people together. Friendship, yes. You'll never guess what, I've met Giuseppe and Giuseppe, and they're cousins, and they've come here to this meet, and this is your 125, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And how far have you travelled on this to get here? Um, well, roughly about six, seven miles, about cool. Hersham area, Walton and Thames. Yeah, not too far then? No, not too far. I come here every Sunday, so I every like, Sunday. it's an enjoyable place watching everyone ride. So. It's lovely. I've just found Kate and Sue, brilliant backpacks and both lady bikers. So how far did you travel to get here today? Brighton. Brighton, that's quite a way really. Yeah, we come up most Sundays, stop off at another bike stop on the way. But and you've got, a superb, you've got a superb pillion best, passenger. Best pillion passenger, it doesn't scream when you go too quick. <laughs> <laughs> or slow in my case. <laughs> Do you come from Brighton as well, Sue? Yes, yes. I have. Superb. So what sort of bike have you got? Matching Piglet. No, I mean matching Homer over there. Oh, yellow. so yellow Suzuki. SV650. How long have you been riding that? A week. Really? <laughs> I've only had it a week. My goodness, so what bike did you have before then? I didn't, I've only just passed my test. Excellent. Yeah. So what brought you to this meet? How did you find out about this place? I don't know really. Just we came up here previously, didn't we? When yeah. Two of us had bikes before, and Sue and Tony used to come up with us. So, but now we all four come together, which is quite nice. And all on your own bikes. Yeah. 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 Well, what more could you want? Spectacular scenery, great company, lots of biker history, an abundance of wildlife. Box Hill has it all. But if you haven't been convinced, maybe I should leave you with a quote from Rudyard Kipling. He was inspired by the spectacular scenery here on the wheels of Surrey and Sussex and described them as wooded, dim, blue goodness. Well, he does write exceedingly good books. I'll see you next week. Get those leathers on and maybe I'll meet you at the meet. Welcome once again to Better Bikes. Now I've had a word with Paul and apparently one or two of you have been ringing the office and saying, I haven't heard the bike running yet. Well, I have actually heard it and I listened to it obviously just before I bought it. So to prove the point, I shall now start it for you. There we go, sweet as a nut. Anyway, enough about that. So I have been busy since we last met I've changed, or I've actually put on these pipes, I put the originals on because it is going for its MOT and it does have to have the originals on for the MOT. I've also tried my Scorpion cans on as well, 
They'll look nice on there. I don't know whether I'm ever going to fit them because I can only use them on private roads. Anyway, enough about that. I've also fitted the rear hugger. So that's now done. I've checked everything round. I've tightened everything up. So everything at this back end now is completely finished. Moving up to the front, if you can remember in an earlier programme, I actually took the front subframe off and repaired it. And I did say at the time that I wouldn't be able to tell whether it fitted or not until I actually got the nose cone. Well, if you can remember, also earlier on in the programme, we went to Rivington Barn and Julian said that next time he was in France, he would pick me up a nice front nose cone. Well, there it is, all finished, headlamp fitted. We put the duct in for the oil cooler. Everything's ready to go. On the front, if I can just turn it round there, I've put the pads on because we're going to put a cover over it just to save the, the, the headlight itself. So, enough about that. Come back in a few minutes and we'll be getting on with it. Well there you go, that didn't take long, did it? Well, it looks as though it's finished to me. A couple of little tips for you before we finish all together. You probably noticed as I was putting the fairing on, I connected all the headlamps up first, the two wires that go to the headlamps, the one that goes to the side lamp. Make sure those are connected, switch it on and off a couple of times, make sure your connection is perfect. Also on the Blackbird, we've got indicators in the wing mirror here. Connect those up, make sure that they're right, there's nothing worse than having to take the fairing off again once you've got it all on just because this isn't connected or that's connected. You'll also probably notice I put a little edge around the double bubble screen. A couple of quid just finishes it off a treat. I think it looks quite good. Another tip for you, you probably notice I wasn't dashing around the workshop. A couple of little boxing, boxes, top fairing and mirrors, infill panel, all the screws and bolts go in that one and that was for when I had the seat panel and the tank off. So Keep it nice and neat, you know where everything is, you're not dashing around looking for parts. What I'm going to do now then is just check round all the levels, check wheel alignment, check the clutch level, clutch fluid level as I say, brake fluid level, go round it, check all the bulbs, stop bulbs, make sure everything's working. We're just about ready for the MOT. I'll see you next week, take care. And we'll catch up with Gary at the MLT station on Two Wheels next week and see if all of his hard work has been worthwhile. Also on next week's show, Sarah visits another bike meet and Jeff takes a ride on Aprilia's Futura. And we'll catch up with Richard Hammond on his Scottish tour of the Highlands and Islands. <laughs>